In episode 1 of The Fall of the House of Usher, titled A Midnight Dreary, which happens to be the famous line from Raven Nevermore, we meet the Usher family as the wealthy CEO faces a criminal investigation amid tragedy, trauma, and a supernatural threat. The Usher family learns that an informant lurks amongst them. As we open this show with quick flashes of a party set in 1980, we see a stone wall, a raven, and a smiling demon. Which leads us into this funeral of three people that we'll later meet in this episode as this mysterious figure watches from the balcony. We learn that the Usher family has been attached to a string of recent deaths, either brutally murdered or died of an apparent suicide, and according to the post-it notes, they all died a little over a week apart. Leaving only Roderick and his granddaughter, his his sister Madeline and Arthur Pym, their family attorney, as the last one standing but also potential suspects. Assistant U.S. Attorney Charles Dupin, who has been investigating this family for most of his career, he gets a personal invitation from Roderick Usher to meet at this mysterious location. After years of working to catch him, he finally gets the opportunity to speak with him directly with no attorneys present, no following protocols, just a confession from Roderick Usher himself. We learn this location is actually where Roderick and his sister grew up as he bought the whole neighborhood for moments just like this to use as a pick-me-up. Now Roderick has over 73 charges and he's willing to confess to them all and even give the pen a bonus which is the actual truth behind how his children actually died. But first, we must start from the beginning. We meet his mother, Eliza, who shares the same name of Edgar Allan Poe's mother, who is a personal secretary of the CEO of Fortunato Pharmaceuticals, William Longfellow. Her mother had one rule, and that was Madeline and Roderick to never come to Longfellow's house, who lived on the same block as them. But Madeline convinced her brother to sneaking over and hopping over their fence. As Roderick slips and falls and is caught by Longfellow and his mother finally arrives, he whispers to her that they were told to never come to this house. As it is implied in this scene, and later confirmed in this episode, he was the father of the two kids and clearly disowned them and kept this relationship a secret. This wasn't confirmed in this episode, but one would assume that the truth eventually came out that he was their father and they eventually probably inherited the company a little bit later in their lives and that's where all their fortune came from. Cut to 1962, where Eliza is now sick and she refuses to see a doctor. Now, Madeline always knew about her mother and her father as her and her brother went to his house for help, even though this was against their mother's orders. Unfortunately, Longfellow wasn't a man of morals or care as he doesn't help them and eventually their mother dies. Their mother refused for them to get anyone involved in this matter as the kids are left to burying her in the backyard alone. Definitely makes you feel a level of sympathy for the kids at this young age as they were tasked to do this without any help. But on a stormy night, they find their mother is missing from her grave as footsteps lead to their home. As they believe they might have made a mistake by burying their mother who might have still been alive as she arrives in the shadows of the dark and grabs and chokes her son against the wall as he apologizes. As she appears to clearly be dead, but we never learn this episode how and why she was able to rise from the dead, but one would imagine it fits into a very similar theme in Edgar Allan Poe's stories, which is revenge. As she eventually releases her son and she heads directly over to Longfellow's house, she ends up killing him in front of his wife. Now back to the confession, the story went that Longfellow died of an apparent heart attack as this was a cover up by Roderick once he got older. Now this was a secret that carried with them and unlike Edgar Allan Poe whose mother died when he was young which caused his siblings to split up, but in this case Roderick and his sister Madeline stayed together and they loved their mother even more after killing their father from the grave. Dupin doesn't understand why he's telling him the story of his dead mother, as Roderick tells him because she's right behind him. Dupin believes this is a power tactic and he doesn't want to turn around and look, but as we the audience see, there was definitely someone standing behind him, which was a great effect. Now Roderick believed the opposite of Longfellow, and if you were an usher, you were welcome to the family. As he has six kids by five different women, this was a matter of principle for him. As we cut to two weeks ago, the last time the usher family was in a the same place alive as is in a courtroom for the most meaningful pharmaceutical prosecution in history. See the family in court as Charles gives his opening arguments, arguments that impress Roderick himself. Not in 40 years, the Usher family has not been found guilty of literally anything, not even a speeding ticket. But this time is different. This time, Charles tells the judge and jury that a family member is ready to speak against the family in this case, which shocks everyone in the courtroom, including the enforcer Pym, as Charles has to withhold the identity of this informant for now. 
As we get a variety of scenes of showing the different family members trying to guess who the rat is, this clearly shows the lack of trust they have in one another, but also they want to find who the rat is to impress their dad. As we meet the rest of the Usher family, we have Frederick Usher and his family, who's the oldest son, we meet Tamerlane, who's the oldest daughter, and we also meet her husband, William. We meet Victorine, who is the oldest of Roderick's illegitimate children, and her girlfriend, Al. We have Napoleon Usher, who's also one of Roderick's illegitimate children. We meet Camilla, who is one of Roderick's illegitimate children as well, but she's also working in the public relations of the company. We have Prospero Usher, who's the youngest of Roderick's illegitimate children. And we end with Juno Usher, who is the second wife of Roderick, who apparently is a former drug addict. Now you'll notice that most of the main characters are named after Edgar Allan Poe's work, which probably gives us an indicator how they're going to end up dying. I'm going to say now, this cast and the acting has been excellent so far, as Roderick gathers the family for a meeting, but before that, we see that he gets a scare from that mysterious person that was at the funeral. Now, Pym, as they call him, Pym the Reaper, gives the family and the kids a non-disclosure agreement to sign, which shows their loyalty to the family. To me, this scene perfectly showcases the witty and hilarious writing so far and the back-and-forth banter of this cast, which has been phenomenal, but it also shows the distrust and the hostility between them, but more more importantly, every actor seems to be perfectly casted in their respective roles. As Roderick puts a $50 million bounty on the rat and whoever finds this rat wins the money. It's important to note this was the last time he saw all of them together alive. Now back with the conversation with Dupin, Roderick claims that he's responsible for the death of his children and he wants to tell him about the woman in true resolution. As we cut to the last day of 1979 leading to New Year's of 1980, we meet the adult versions of Roderick and Madeline. Now this is where they meet Verna, aka the Raven. Now it's clear as day that they have done something bad as they're using this bar visit as an alibi for their whereabouts for whatever they've done. This was the night that the company completely changed, but the question is, what actually happened that night? See Verna talking to them about sitting outside of time and space as it seems like they're making some type of offering or some type of deal, almost like they're making a deal with the devil as his mother, his children, and the party are very important to his confession. As we end the episode heading back to the funeral, she's here. Roderick knows this and sees all of his dead children looking down upon him. Roderick enters his car and sees a figure dressed as a jester as he passes out and a raving's looking down upon him as it is time. This gesture would point towards the cast on Mascalano, which is a story of a man named Antresto who decides to seek revenge again named Fortunato who insults him. Might be a similar story to what we got after this episode one, someone seeking revenge. Now, some of the big questions after this first episode is, number one, who's the informant, but also, what did the siblings do to Verna on that night of New Year's Eve? As the fall of the House of Usher, episode one is officially in the books. So many amazing moments, some very effective scares so far. This has been very riveting, cleverly written. The performances are so entertaining and engaging, and I'm ready to see what Mike Flanagan has for another classic series on Netflix. Before we wrap the video up, consider hitting the like button, sharing today's video, and leave your thoughts on this first episode in the comments below but also click the video on the screen right now or click the link in the description to see my next video discussing episode two you all are great hope you're staying safe consider subscribing and thanks for watching this breakdown of episode one of the fall of the house of usher